invite you, if you have your Bible, that you would turn with me to the book of Joshua, chapter 1. <laughs> this evening, tonight, we begin a new series in the book of Joshua, and we've titled this evening's message, Strong and Courageous Leadership. We all need leadership, but what type of leadership we need, we find here in the book of Joshua. Strong and courageous leadership. Now, if you've ever read the book of Joshua, you know that we learn from it how to live a victorious Christian life. How can you and I today, in the world that we're living in, live a victorious Christian life? And the reason why we're studying the book of Joshua is because we want to grow when it comes to taking steps of faith. We want to mature spiritually. We want to grow strong in the spirit now. And tonight what we're going to do is really set the stage. (laughs) We're going to give an introduction as to where the nation of Israel is, who Joshua is, and how he plays a role in taking the people of Israel into the promised land. You see, because we, when we open our Bibles, we realize that it had been 40 years of wandering. <laughs> Have you ever wandered one year, one hour maybe? Well, it had been 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. And it took the nation of Israel 40 years to get to a place that would regularly take a 10-day journey. Why? Because they were impatient, because they were ungrateful, and because they were disobedient. <laughs> Have you ever felt that maybe it's taking longer to arrive at the destination of where God wants you? And oftentimes it's because we are ungrateful, because we're impatient, and maybe oftentimes even because we're disobedient. And we spend time in the wilderness when God wants us to step into the promised land. I want you to tell you something even tonight, that the wilderness is never the permanent destination God has for us. The wilderness is never God's permanent destination for his church. And here in the book of Joshua, we're going to see that this is a book, notice this, of new beginnings. New beginnings for the people of God and also new beginnings for believers today that are in need of a new beginning. (laughs) Maybe you like beginning new things, or maybe you don't like beginning new things. (laughs) Here, the book of Joshua teaches us the beginning of a new season, because for Joshua and for the nation of Israel, Moses had been the only leader they ever had. In fact, Moses doesn't just come out of the picture here in the book of Joshua. He's mentioned some 50 times in this book. As Joshua is the successor of Moses now, Joshua introduces now a new beginning. Joshua introduces now a new generation. And Joshua introduces a new leadership. But I want you to pay attention to this very carefully because Joshua did not take over. He didn't take over. Joshua carried on the work to the next place. Oftentimes we think, well, that leader is going to take over. No, he's not taking over here, Joshua. Joshua is now carrying on the work to the next place. I like what Ellen Radpat said when he said this, a wise leader doesn't completely abandon the past, but builds on it as he or she moves towards the future. You know what's wise that we do, that we learn from the lessons of history, from those that have gone before us. Because that's what Joshua did. He was a faithful leader, a faithful successor to Moses. And he didn't completely abandon the past. In fact, all he did was to build on the work that was already taking place. And I want to tell you this, Moses was a symbol of deliverance. As he led the people out of Egypt, he led them out of bondage and delivered them. God used Moses to deliver the people out of bondage. They came straight out of bondage. (laughs) Just like us, our testimony that we were in bondage, but the Lord freed us from the Egypt or or from the world that we were in. And as Moses is a symbol of deliverance, well, Joshua, notice this, is an emblem of victory. 
Because they're able to arrive at the promised land that God had for them, the inheritance. Moses led them out of bondage and Joshua took the people into blessing. They go from bondage into blessing. Yes, Moses brought them through the Red Sea, but Joshua crossed them over the Jordan now. And Joshua, as we read this entire book throughout the next few months, represents a life in the spirit that can take us where the law cannot. Now notice, the spirit, the Holy Spirit takes us far beyond the place that the law could ever have taken us. And that's what Joshua represents, a change of leadership that takes us to the next place. You know what's so interesting? I love what Oswald Sanders in his book, Spiritual Leadership, says when he says this. He says, a work originated by God and conducted on spiritual principles will surmount the shock of a change of leadership and indeed will probably thrive better as a result. Now notice what Joshua did. Joshua built on the biblical principles that God had given Moses. And you know what takes place here? The lesson that Joshua teaches us, the lesson that we need to learn even this evening, the lesson that we need to learn is faith is the victory that overcomes every trial in life. What is is the victory? Faith is the victory. Wasn't it the apostle John that when he wrote in 1 John chapter 5, verse 4, he said, and this is the victory that has overcome the world What is the victory that's overcome the world? Our faith. Our faith is the victory. And in this book, we're going to learn what it means to take a step of faith. What it means to trust God to go beyond the place where we are right now so that we can inherit everything that God has for us. Because oftentimes we rob ourselves from how God wants to use us, where God wants to take us, how God wants to lead us because of fear because of discouragement, and because of disobedience. And maybe right now you're battling with something that God's calling you to do. He's calling you to take a step of faith. He's calling you to draw nearer to him. But there's something standing in the way. (laughs) Maybe it's fear. Maybe it's discouragement or disobedience. Or how about this? Doubt in your mind. Well, we're going to learn three different spiritual experiences that are symbolic through the nation of Israel, and we learn first Egypt. Now, what is Egypt? How does that symbolize a spiritual experience for us? Well, Egypt is a place that's symbolic of the world. In Egypt, we learn that we were a people that were in bondage, that we were delivered now from the bondage of the enemy and from the bondage of sin. But what happens after Egypt? The people go into the wilderness. You know what the wilderness represents in a spiritual walk in life? Well, the wilderness experience represents a life of unbelief. The wilderness represents a life of compromise. And notice this, please. The wilderness represents a life of always looking back. You know that you're living in a wilderness experience in your spiritual walk right now if you're consistently looking back at, from what God already delivered you from. Do you remember the nation of Israel where they always look back in the wilderness as to where God had taken them from? And they said, oh, the Lord just took us out of there simply now to let us die out here in the wilderness. Let us go back to Egypt. And because of their flesh, they're tempted to go back from that which God already delivered them from. But what about Canaan, the promised land? Well, Canaan symbolizes a life of victory. Canaan symbolizes a life of rest. It symbolizes entering and stepping into the promises of God due to faith and due to obedience. And that's where we as a church want to step into the place of the promises of God. Amen. Now, we see this is so important for us. Because this is an illustration for us as believers before even we jump into chapter 1. On how today we need to say bye to the old lifestyle so that we can enter into the rich inheritance that God has for us. Today we need to now murder the flesh 
put the flesh to death so that we can step into that which God has for him, so that we can go from those that were complaining in the wilderness to now conquering in Canaan. You see, if your life is full with complaints, then you know maybe I'm in the wilderness. Or is your life filled with the Spirit of God when you're consistently going from victory to victory? Ask yourself today, am I in the wilderness or I am in the land of promise, in the land of victory? In my spiritual walk, in your own spiritual walk right now, do you have victory over the flesh? Or are you still living in bondage? You know, there are some people that live their, their entire Christian lives in the wilderness. <laughs> and yes, they're delivered from bondage, but they continue to compromise for the rest of their life. They never step into the fullness of what God has for them. They never experience the fullness of the Spirit. We fail oftentimes to experience victory over the flesh. We're consistently in bondage to that which God wants to take us away from. We fail to experience victory even over fear. And here Joshua is going to teach us what it means in our own spiritual walk to cross the Jordan into the fullness of what Christ has for us. Now, there are three major purposes as to why we see the book of Joshua that is written. The first one is historical. And I want you to take note if you're a student of the Bible this evening, historical because it teaches us how God brought a holy nation into a holy land. How God took them there, how God led them, how God fulfilled the promises he had to the nation of Israel. Now, the second reason as to why this book is written is doctrinal. How is it filled with doctrine? Well, the book of Joshua is filled with doctrine because it manifests God's faithfulness to his promises. That when God said something, notice this, he's going to fulfill that which he said. (laughs) And a victorious life must be lived in faith in God. It, It teaches us that God keeps his promises and that we live a victorious life as we put our faith and our trust in God. But finally, number three, the third reason as to why this is written, and we see from the Bible from beginning to end that it speaks of one thing, redemption. Would you write that in your Bible? Redemption. Because we see a Christological reason as to why the book of Joshua is written. What does that mean? (laughs) That Joshua now is a type of a Christ Jesus, a redeemer in the Old Testament. In fact, did you know that the name of Joshua from Now, the Hebrew to Greek is translated the same name, Yeshua, which we are where we have the translation of Jesus. And Joshua really serves as a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ who won the victory over sin and over Satan and gives us the freedom over the bondage of sin as we trust and put our full assurance on him. He foreshadows Christ as Christ leads us in a life a victory. Now, how does Joshua arrive at the place that he's at? Because Moses passed the baton of leadership to him, (laughs) right? It says in Deuteronomy chapter 34, verse 9, now Joshua, the son of Nun, was full of the spirit of wisdom, for Moses had laid his hand on him. So the children of Israel heeded him and did as the Lord had commanded Moses. It said that Moses brought Joshua before the people and did what God told Moses to do, lay his hands on Joshua and said, Joshua is the next leader. You see that there is order, that there is clarity now in how he passed on the leadership to Joshua so that he would continue. But who is Joshua? Why is it that Joshua was elected to do this significant calling and work? Why why is it that the Lord raised them up to lead the people and the nation of Israel into the promised land. You know why? Because Joshua learned how to follow, therefore he knew how to lead. You know that the best leaders are those that first learned how to follow? (laughs) And Joshua went from servant leadership, notice this, to courageous leadership. (laughs) A lot of times we want to go to courageous leadership, everything that I can do for God with a lot of boldness, but without a heart of a servant. Joshua was a man of, of a courageous heart that, yes, he wanted to face the enemy. Yes, he had faith to believe in God of the victory. 
But notice this, he had a heart of a servant, of a servant. And there are three things that we see as we enter Joshua chapter one that God does for Joshua and what he wants to do for me and for you when he gives you a calling. Because oftentimes when God calls us, you know what the, the thing that we all, often ask ourselves, am I qualified? <laughs> and when God asks you to do something, when he has a calling on your life and, and it's, it, it surpasses your own understanding, what you should ask yourself is not, am I qualified? Notice this, are you called? I'd rather follow a person that is not qualified but is called because they're being led by the Lord. And you have to make sure that those that we follow are those not simply because they're called by, they're qualified by man, but that they're called by God. You know what God did for Joshua? Number one, God equipped Joshua. God equipped Joshua. God doesn't call the equipped. He equips the called. God equipped Joshua. Then in the first nine verses that we're going to read right now, God encouraged Joshua to go forward. Has God ever called you to do something and you are overanalyzing the situation, not knowing whether or not you should step out? Well, God encouraged Joshua, step out, step out in faith. God wants to bless you. God wants to fulfill his promises in your life. You need to trust him and you need to step out. God equips him. God encourages him. And notice this, God enables him. He gives him the ability to do it. And we learn a very critical lesson that victory comes through faith in God and obedience to his word, notice this, rather than through military, as we see the book of Joshua, might or numerical support, uh, uh, numbers. You see, you're going to see in the book of Joshua that he was outnumbered many times. <laughs> but notice what, who was on his side? God was on his side. Just like the song we just sang, if God is for us, who can be against us? And Joshua was prepared for ministry. I'm going to ask you today, are you preparing yourself for the promises of God? Are you preparing yourself for that which you have been praying for? <laughs> you know that Joshua was prepared, and that's why he was a man that God would use. Do you remember back in Numbers when now... Moses sent out the 12 to spy the land of Canaan, the promised land, and 10 of them came back and said, no, we cannot inherit the land. But Joshua and Caleb said, yes, the Lord has given us that land. What did the Lord say? Tell Moses that except for Caleb, the son of Jephna, and Joshua, the son of Nun, you shall by no means enter the land which I swore to make you dwell in. You know what Joshua was in his preparation? He was faithful in boldness. He was faithful in boldness. Why? Because he believed that God can do what he said he would do. Oftentimes we need to pray, Lord, do what only you can do. <laughs> God, do what only you can do. Joshua and Caleb believed that God can give them the land. He was faithful in boldness. But he also, number two, notice this, he was faithful in battle. <laughs> We oftentimes remember that illustration of Moses and Aaron and Ur uh, just sitting on two stones and raising up the arms of Moses. Have, have we not all seen that picture? But you know what Moses said when they started to go into battle with the Amalekites as his, he was sitting on that rock and they were holding up his arms up, Aaron on one side and Ur on the other side? He said, Joshua, go out and fight the Amalekites. We often think about Moses up on the mountain. Guess who was fighting down there? It was Joshua fighting the Amalekites. Joshua was faithful in boldness. Joshua was faithful in battle. And finally, Joshua was faithful before God. Please remember that tonight, church, faithful before God. What does that mean? Well, in Exodus chapter 33, notice this. 33.11, it says, so the Lord spoke to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. God was speaking to Moses and he would return to the camp, but his servant Joshua, notice, Moses was in the tabernacle and he would go back to the camp after God spoke to him, but his servant Joshua, the son of Nun, the young man did not depart from the tabernacle. Just think about that. The Lord was hovering over the tabernacle. He was speaking to Moses face to face. You know what happened? Moses would go back to the, the camp. And you know who would stay in the tabernacle? 
who would stay faithful to the presence of God, Joshua would stay at the tabernacle. I'm going to ask you tonight, are you faithful in boldness? Are you faithful in battle when it comes to spiritual warfare to fight the enemy? But finally, are you faithful before God? Because all of us want to be used by God, but it's not until you're faithful in boldness, faithful in battle, and faithful before God that you truly can see God take you where he wants to use you. I love what Chuck Smith said when he said this, God will bless you to the level that you allow him to bless you, and then he will use you there. (laughs) What an amazing thing to know that. Now, the book of Joshua is broken down in three sections. From chapters 1 to chapter 5, we see the dedication of a nation. They're entering the land. From chapter 6 to 12, you see the defeat of the enemy. They arrive at the land, but now they have many battles that they have to face. Notice this. When God blesses you, when he takes you, when you arrive at the place of promise, there are going to be many battles that you have to face in order to inherit that which God wants to give you. And then finally, the division of the land from chapters 13 to chapters 24. As we look at Joshua chapter 1 right now, we're going to see something very important here as we learn what it means to take steps of faith. God commissions Joshua, and God also commands Joshua. God commissions Joshua, and then he commands him. God's commissioning, God's calling is God's command on your life. If God has a calling on your life, notice this, it is a command. He's going to enable you. He's going to encourage you. He's going to equip you to take you to the place where you experience the fullness of the Spirit and where the flesh no longer has bondage over you. Now, in Joshua chapter 1, let's look at now God's calling on Joshua. Joshua 1, verse 1. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, It came to pass that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses, his assistant, saying, Moses, my servant is dead. Now therefore, arise, go over this Jordan, you and all this people, to the land which I'm giving you to them, the children of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given you, as I have said to Moses, from the wilderness and this Lebanon, as far as, underline that, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, and to the great sea toward the going down of the sun shall be your territory. Verse 5, no man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and courageous, for to this people you shall divide an inheritance, the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous, that you may observe to do everything and all according to the law which Moses my servant commanded you to do. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may prosper wherever you go. Why don't we pray right now? And Lord, Heavenly Father, we ask right now, God, as we open your word, that you would lead us to take steps of faith. And as you lead us, Lord, lead us with your promises. Lead us with your presence and lead us with your precepts. I pray that you encourage those that are here, maybe listening online, (laughs) that God is calling them to take a step of faith in obedience. That God's calling them to trust you more, Lord. That God is calling us, even right now as a church, to step into the place where we are going to see your blessing and your promises fulfilled, even for this body. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. And together we said, amen. Now, there are three things, as we read only eight, nine verses tonight, (laughs) that we're going to see that God leads Joshua with. How God leads you to take steps of faith as well. How does God lead us to take steps of faith? Now, he leads us, number one, with his promises. He leads us, number two, with his presence. (laughs) I will go with you. And finally, God leads us with his precepts or with his word. Oftentimes, we're praying, well, is this a 
a step of faith, and this of the Lord, will ask yourself, has God promised this in your life? Is this of the Lord? Is, is the presence of God going before you where you see him opening the door for this? And finally, do you see any confirmation in Scripture that God is saying, go? Now, you see here in verse 1, after the death of Moses. Why is this important to look at this? Because God's calling Joshua. But it was after the death of Moses. After one season ended, another season began. Please write this down in your Bible. Next to verse 1, everything is a season. Would you say that out loud with me? Everything is a season. Everything's a season now. And the Lord here spoke to Joshua. Notice it says here now, the Lord spoke, it came to pass that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant. That it refers to Moses as a servant of the Lord, a man that faithfully served the Lord. But it says that the Lord was speaking to Joshua, the assistant of Moses. I love that it uses that word, assistant of Moses, or Moses' assistant, because it speaks of a faithfulness in Joshua. Joshua was faithful to assist Moses. And Joshua, because he was faithful to assist Moses, and because he lingered in the presence of God, he knew how to discern the voice of God. <laughs> now, do you see that here? It says that the Lord spoke to Joshua. Has the Lord been speaking to you lately? How you've been spending time close to the tabernacle, to the most holy place that you know this is God speaking right now. Well, the Lord spoke to Joshua and he discerned that this voice was the voice of God because he spent time in the presence of God. And notice what God was saying because he says it in verse 2, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now he's saying, Joshua, you know what time it is. <laughs> and maybe he's asking you and telling you right now, my son, my daughter, you know the time that God has called you. He has called you for such a time as this. In verse 2, it says, Moses, my servant is dead. Arise and go over. Well, Lord, are you speaking to me to stand up and to go? Maybe I've been praying about this. Maybe I've been holding on to this. Well, yes, that's for you right now tonight. Arise and go. Lord, I was waiting for you to give me a sign from your word. Here it is in verse 2. Arise, go over the Jordan. You and all these people to the land which I'm giving to them, the children of Israel. Do you know what he's telling now, Joshua? Joshua was now here. We see some fear in him. We're going to see some discouragement in him. We're going to see even some hesitation. Has God ever called you to do something and you hesitate? Well, I don't know if this is God. I'm just going to wait. And we actually wait longer than what God wants us to wait. Here in verse 2, the divine call comes on Joshua. And you know what the Lord says? Joshua, go forward. Arise and go. The time has come for you to lead this people over the Jordan, for you to cross over now the Jordan that is standing in the way now of the promised land. In fact, he says this in verse 2, to the land that I'm giving to them, the children of Israel, the land that I have promised now to the ancestors. Not only did he promise it, but notice this, God reaffirmed his promises and his covenant to Abraham. What was his covenant to Abraham in Genesis? That he was going to multiply the nation of Israel. And that he was going to give them a land. And his promises, notice this, God's promises are never rescinded. God never promises something and then takes it back. In fact, God repeated this promise to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. <laughs> And now God is fulfilling the promise that he had said. In fact, in the next verse, verse 3, it, it speaks of his promises. God reminds us of his promises when it's time to go. Notice in verse 3, every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given you as I've already said to Moses. I've given you this place and I'm reminded you that every place that the sole of your feet, every step that you take, and every place that you walk on, as I have said to Moses, as I've promised to Moses, I'm promising to you right now. And do you see what, what an amazing now story that we see here now? That God keeps his promises in Numbers chapter 23, verse 19. We see that God, it says this, God's words, God is not a man that he should lie, nor the son of a man that he should repent. Has he said, and will it, he not do so? Or has he spoken, and will he not make it good? 
We have to trust God. When he says something, he is going to fulfill it. And that which God starts, notice this, God will complete. So this calling is from God, but notice the place that God is leading him is also from the Lord. Isn't this amazing here? That Joshua, his only responsibility is to trust God and to walk in the plan of God. I want you to know even tonight, God has a plan for us. God has a plan for you. And our responsibility is to hear his voice, obey him, and to step into the plan of God for our lives. Are you walking in that plan or are you walking somewhere else? (laughs) Because he says every place that you step, every place that you go walking, I'm going to give you just like I promised it. It reminds me of Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10, where Paul tells the church in Ephesus, for we are his workmanship, we are his masterpiece, we are his poema. God had created you for a purpose, and when God created you, you know what he also created? A plan, (laughs) a calling, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which he prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Now, here's the question tonight. Are you walking in God's plan or are you walking in your own plan? Are you walking a life of obedience because that's the plan of God? Or are we walking a life of compromise where we're now wandering in the wilderness? And we haven't made it out of the wilderness. We haven't experienced everything and all the riches and all the inheritance that God has for us in the saints. You know what that is? Christ Jesus. Notice what he says here in verse 4. It says, from the wilderness and this Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river of Euphrates, and all the land of the Hittites to the great sea toward going down to the sun shall be your territory now. What he's explained now is a geographical location. You're going to go as far as, now I want to take you. (laughs) Has God ever wanted to take you somewhere? Lord, not this far. (laughs) No, God wants to take you farther and beyond the borders now of your own understanding. Beyond the borders now of the faith that you think that today you have. He wants to take you beyond. In fact, this geographical location that we read here in verse 4, you know what it represents? It represents now southward, northward, eastward now, and westward. (laughs) We see it now. Oh, now the expanded territory and horizon now. Beyond the borders of where you currently are, I want to expand that territory. Go on forward. I'm going to give it to you. But notice here, this is, there's a blessing here. There's a promise. But there are blessings. And please notice this. There are blessings that we never enjoy because of disobedience and because of fear. I, I want you to remember that tonight. There are blessings that God wants to give us oftentimes that we never enjoy because of fear and because of disobedience. I wonder how many of us have been standing at the edge of the Jordan and God is saying, I need you to cross over. And we keep looking back at the wilderness. Because here now the Lord is calling him, I promise you this, I'm going to complete it now. Now is the time. Do you know that oftentimes we have to wait for God's promises? But you know, as we wait, you know what we have to learn how to do? To listen. Because God one day is going to say, go, and it's going to be time. Notice how God's encouragement comes from verse 5 to verse 7. How does God encourage his people? With his presence. You want encouragement? Go to his presence. (laughs) We all need encouragement right now. In fact, it says this. Now, no man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. I will not leave you. I won't forsake you. As I was with Moses, I will be with you. No one will be able to stand against you. In fact, what he's saying, no one's going to have the power to stop you and the plan that I have in your life. All the days of your life. Now, why was he telling them this? Because Joshua was going to face some battles. Because when we step out in faith, we are going to face opposition. Because when we step out in faith, we are going to have to face some giants to inherit the land. But as we enter the land, we can be certain of one thing, that he who promised that will also go with us and lead us in his presence. Yes, the opposition is promised, 
but also what is promised is the victory after the opposition. (laughs) And what, what he's learning here, Joshua, is to understand, be ready for the opposition. I'm not gonna leave you. No one will be able to stop you. Now, I want you to know this. For us, even right now, for us to be able to take the promises of God serious, if you want to take God's promises serious, you know what you have to do? You have to be willing to declare war on the flesh, against the world, and against the devil. Because the opposition will come. And if you want to enjoy the promises of God, you want to be able to seriously take his promises very seriously, then tonight you have to say, well, Lord, I'm going to declare the war on my flesh, on the world out there, and also on the devil. Because the devil is standing in the way of you and the promises of God for your life. In fact, in the the end of verse 5, it says, as I was faithful to Moses, I will be faithful to you. And Joshua saw God's hand, the faithfulness on Moses. And that's why he says, I will not leave you nor forsaking you. In fact, what he's saying there, I will not fail you and I won't abandon you. Just think about it. Has God failed you up until this point? No, he hasn't. He has not failed you yet and he won't start now. God hasn't failed us. And he's reminding Joshua, Joshua, I'm not going to fail you because Joshua was present during the wilderness years and he saw God's hand be manifested very powerfully and God's presence be manifested in the life of Moses. He saw that God was guiding Moses. He saw that God was providing for the nation of Israel. He saw that God was delivering them from their enemies in the wilderness experience. Now, why did God tell him that? Because God's faithfulness in the past, notice this church right now, God's faithfulness in the past today encourages us to take steps in the present. It is God's faithfulness from yesterday that encourages us to take steps today. Just think about it. This is what he's telling them. He's saying, you can move forward in God's will and be assured of my presence. I am going to be with you and you can have confidence in the decisions you make because I'm not going to abandon you. I'm not going to fail you. Have you ever been concerned in the step of faith when it's time to take a step of faith of the outcome? (laughs) Well, Lord, if I take this step of faith, I'm concerned about what's going to take place, the outcome. What if, notice this, I fail. But who's leading you? Is the Lord leading you or are you going in your own confidence? I love what D.L. Moody said. He said, our greatest fear should not be a failure, but but of succeeding at something that doesn't really matter. Just think about how many times we're chasing for things that don't really matter. And here, Joshua was able to walk in in the courage and the confidence that God was giving him because God was going with him. Now, notice, this is the verse we all love. (laughs) But not only do we have to love it, I want to encourage you tonight to live it. Because if there was ever a time where the church needed this verse, it's today. Because the church has been oftentimes resisting now what God wants to do because of the fear. Because of the fear, notice what he says here now, be strong and of good courage. Be strong and of good courage. He's going to repeat this to him three times. Lead with strength and with courage. And remember that, lead with strength and with courage. Because you are the one that's going to lead these people to possess or to inhabit now the land that I'm giving them. The land that I swore to give to their fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, And to Jacob, you're going to lead them and be strong and courageous. Now, it's not good enough only to be strong. You also have to be courageous. What good is strength without courage? What good is strength without courage? You cannot use strength if you don't have courage to use that strength. (laughs) And what is happening here is that that Joshua was tempted with fear. (laughs) Just think about Moses, the only leader, the only leader that the nation of Israel ever had. (laughs) The only leader that Joshua ever had (laughs) no longer is there. And there are millions of people now that are depending upon Joshua's leadership. Think about the criticism that Joshua would have received. Comparing now Joshua and Moses. The inadequacy that maybe Joshua felt in now taking on this responsibility now 
the discouragement in his mind that he felt. But this was a man with divine commission that would face the challenges now. And he's facing intimidation. He's facing discouragement at the call and at this very hour. So God says, be strong and courageous. I've called you to do this. I'm going to be with you in this now land that I'm calling and I swore to their fathers to give them. Verse 7, only. Circle the word only. Don't be strong, courageous, and then sometimes doubtful. <laughs> only be strong and courageous. Don't move in weakness. Don't be afraid. Don't doubt. Only be strong and of good courage. Verse 6, for to this people you shall divide as an inheritance the land which I swore to the fathers to give them. So be strong and courageous. Notice this. Be very courageous that you may observe, verse 7, to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded. You do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left that you may prosper wherever you go. Now, where does the courage come from? The courage comes from obeying the word of God. Do you see how he says, only be strong and courageous? Why does he say that? Because you need courage oftentimes to obey the word of God. <laughs> Lord, give me the courage to obey. That should be part of our prayer life. And you know what the Lord is doing for Joshua? He's encouraging him for the call. Oftentimes we want to give people advice. You know what the best advice oftentimes is? Sometimes the best advice is this, encouragement. <laughs> there are very few people in the body of Christ that are good at encouraging people. For some reason, we believe that encouragement is bad for somebody. <laughs> In fact, the word encourage means to end, to deposit. The word end, courage, it means to deposit courage into someone else's life. <laughs> Think about how many things we would accomplish for the Lord if we all encouraged one another. Where we would actually go and how many people we would reach and how far we would go if we encourage one another in the calling that God has for us. In fact, the word encourage means to put heart into it. Put your heart into it. Encourage one another. Just put your heart into it. But before God can fulfill his promises in Joshua's life, notice what Joshua had to exercise. Joshua had to exercise faith. He had to exercise strength. He had to exercise courage. And notice this, God's commands are God's enablements. God's commands are God's enablements. What does he tell him here in verse 7? Be careful to obey. Be very careful to obey. Don't just step out. Be very careful to obey everything that is, I've commanded my servant Moses, obey my instructions, obey the word of God, obey the manual, because God's word is our equipment to take steps of faith. This is your equipment, the word of God. Be careful to never leave the word of God as I'm calling you to this next season. Be careful to have a close relationship with the word of God because that's the only way that you're gonna last. You know why a lot of people don't last and, and end up where God wants them to be? Because they deviated. They deviated and when you deviate, you know what you ha happens? You end up wandering. You end up wandering. In fact, in the end, of, in the second half of verse seven, it says, "Don't turn, don't deviate from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may prosper, or that you may be blessed, or that you may have victory." Now, I don't want you to look at the word "prosper" as the word "success." I want you to look at the word "prosper" as the word "victory," <laughs> because there's a big difference between being successful and in man's eyes, and, and, and walking in victory in the eyes of the Lord. You know what he's saying? Be careful to obey the word of God so that you can walk in victory for the rest of your life. Be careful to not deviate to the left or to the right so that you will be blessed in this which God is calling you. And, and it, it speaks about not only a victory, but it speaks about a spiritual well-being so that you can spiritually be well wherever you go in everything that you do, that you will be blessed. Now, what does this tell us about the word of God? That the word of God is our source of strength and the word of God is our source of encouragement. 
Now, as good as it is to be encouraged by the body of Christ, because it is a gift of the Spirit to be encouraged or to use encouragement, I want you to know the primary place of encouragement is in the Bible. It's in the Bible. And in those moments of discouragement, when you don't know if really the Lord is calling you to do this, you know what you have to do is go to the Word of God. The success here, the, the now prospering here, the, the victory here, the blessing here, it, it depended more on his spiritual state and his degree in, of obedience rather than any kind of military strategy. You oftentimes think, well, we have a new strategy. Now we're going to prosper. No, you know what? The prospering took place. It was all contingent. It was all dependent upon one thing, obedience to the word of God. Joshua, we're going to learn here that the secret of Joshua's victories was not a skill with the sword, but it was submission to the word of God. Let's go to verse 8 here now, because this is God's equipping in verse 8. Notice what he says. This book of the law, wherever you go, God's going to be with you. But this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it, For then you shall make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. A lot of times people say, well, you know what? I'm looking to really grow in my devotional time with the Lord. I don't know, should I read my Bible in the morning, or should I read it at night? Well, the Word of God says, read it day and night. (laughs) Both. (laughs) Now, notice what happens here. As God is equipping them with the Word of God, and studying the word of God continually. He says, don't let it depart from your mouth. Don't let it depart from your mouth. I love this here. But not only does it talk about uh, your, your part from your mouth, but also notice what it says, meditate on it. From your mouth, from your lips, from your mind, and in your heart, hide the word of God. You know, this is exactly what the church needs right now. What comes out of your mouth? The things that come out of your mouth, is that what you're meditating on it? Don't let it depart from your mouth. In fact, observe to do it. Be sure to obey everything that is written in it. He's referencing scripture. Now the Lord is telling them this. You know what the word meditate means? It, it, it means to read with thoughtfulness, to linger over God's word as our spiritual food of nourishment, to, to, to read out loud. That's what it means to meditate. It means to talk to ourselves and to talk to other people about the word of God out loud, about the Bible, to reflect now upon God's word in a thoughtful way. Well, I want to reflect on God's word. What does that mean, that scripture mean? How can I appropriate that in my life, that truth personally to me? How can I apply it so that I can have a close relationship with the Bible? (laughs) Do you have a close relationship with the Bible today? In fact, I want to encourage you, get back to your Bible. Because you cannot meditate on the word if you don't know the word. You can't meditate on the word if you don't know. And and notice this, day and night. You know why? Because it takes time and there are no shortcuts to holiness. There are no shortcuts to holiness. That's why we have to refuse any engagement that will keep you away from meditating on the word of God. You know what we need to learn to do today in in, in a time where there's so much chaos and noise as the worship team would have come out right now? In a time where there's a lot of chaos and noise, we need to learn what it means to be silent with an open Bible waiting for God to speak. When was the last time you went home, you opened your Bible in silence and you were waiting for God to speak? In fact, I want to encourage you tonight to go back home Open your Bible in silence and wait for God to speak. You would become a lover of the word of God. You know, in Psalms chapter one, David talks about the man that is blessed, that lives that blessed life. You know what he says? But his delight is in the law of the Lord and in his law, he meditates on it day and night. He meditates on it day and night. He shall be like a tree that's planted by the rivers of water that brings forth fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. I want to encourage you tonight, if you want to live a victorious Christian life where you no longer 
you no longer are in bondage to fear or you no longer are in bondage to doubt or you no longer are in bondage to now sin that you're not looking back in the wilderness notice what we have to do not only trust God but meditate on his word and make up our mind that's saying Lord I'm, I'm going to take your promises seriously and the, re- the way I'm going to do that is by meditating on your word the biggest need in the church not only is it prayer but there's a biblical illiteracy that oftentimes we don't know the word of God you know why we don't meditate on the word of God because we don't memorize the word of God there was a day we memorized the word of God and you know now why we don't memorize it because we have a cell phone So I don't have to memorize the Word of God. You can't meditate the Word of God unless it's in your heart. We need to go back to the Word of God so that we can go to that place with full confidence that God is leading us in. Can we stand tonight?